Um, well, <clears throat> actually in uh, 1998, we, uh, we did the Add a Loss Tour, of course, <clears throat> in support of that record. And uh, <clears throat> I personally was still struggling uh, pretty hard with fucking my addiction. And uh, I got, we were all based in Wilmington at the time. I originally from Charlotte, they were all from Wilmington. I was living in Wilmington and uh, decided to uh, go back to Charlotte and uh, try to get to a better situation with that. You know, there was really no intention of uh, not getting back together to do something, do a new record, or whatever. And uh, people were coming to fuck with me. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, once I got back to Charlotte, uh, I made the decision to go into a uh, like a long-term rehab, and uh, <clears throat> I pretty much stuck with that pretty hardcore for like a year, year and a half. And, uh, you know, along with that, you know, disconnected, not, not from everybody. I still communicated and talked to people, and <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I mean, I was doing the whole hardcore halfway house, all that shit. Stuck with that for quite a while, and uh, then I uh, <clears throat> relapsed, as they call it, and got back into fucking music pretty hardcore again. And uh, then I went a different route. I got on a methadone program, <clears throat> and actually uh, was still involved, like you know, in the program, AA and A stuff like that. Like not real big time, but had people that I associated with. I didn't go to a lot of meetings. Know, stay connected with people that um, I talked to, you know, and, and, and stay disconnected. I didn't really go out a lot and do anything. I was pretty much trying to stay clean. And uh, yeah, I, I think the hiatus went for so long because, like, uh, being on, I, I went, I was on so much methadone because I, um, I needed to be. I was on my history, uh, like 120 milligrams. And uh, yeah, and I stayed on it. And you know, now there's a there's a uh, if you're a long-term opiate addict these days, they let you stay on it for life. You know, pretty much they found that you know that's better. And, uh, to be honest, that's kind of where I'm at now. Uh, I mean, all this is personal shit. I don't even know really, but something we like haven't talked about. But I'm pretty open because I feel like you know I want people to know that you know there's an alternative. You're in that position because uh, you know when 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 fucking when and, and I wasn't the only one in both of them who was you know struggling with this uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'll let them speak for themselves of course but uh, it was like uh, oh my goodness uh, for me it's like you know to go the complete entire sober route it's like. Fucking, I couldn't do it. You know, I did it for like six months at one time. Um, I think the longest I went was for about nine months, and that was when I was in the halfway house. And I, was, I mean, it was protected environments. You know, it was constant fucking meetings, counseling around those people, disconnected from everything else. And uh, it's it's a very difficult thing. Man. I mean, it's, it's a fucking it's a fucking disease that I don't think people understand. Even when you get off the dope, man, it affects every area of your life. Man. I'm even a crazier, you know, mind stuff, you know, was even crazier being completely clean. And uh, anyway, you know, after I relapsed and I got on methadone, um, the methadone, though, the, the amount that I was on and stuff, I became very unmotivated really to do anything. I, I got into this uh, click of fucking doing nothing. Um, Unfortunately and unfortunately, my family, like my mom, she was still like, you know, here I am fucking, what, 30 something years old, living at home with mom, fucking, you know, she was sick, you know, take somebody to help take care of her, and uh, I went to the clinic, took care of her, and watched fucking TV, and uh, before you know it, three years have gone by, and, uh, you know, during all this time, I'm, I'm doing acoustic stuff, you know, that's the Kaloy thing started in the long-term rehab. I fucking, that's all I could have was an acoustic. 
and um, I started really diving and doing that. And, um, <clears throat> and even now, I mean, I'm still on opiate assisted medicine. I mean, I, sometimes I've, I've been on Suboxone treatment for a while, but I'm coming to the end of that, and now I'm going back over to methadone, but not as much. How was Suboxone taking? I guess you know something about this. Well, they started me at two, and uh, just three milligrams. What's that? Two milligrams? Two. No, no, two, two eight, eight milligrams. Yeah, which really wasn't wasn't a lot. I mean, I was on 120 milligrams for ten years. Nothing was straight. I mean, I, I, you know, even when I was coming down here and doing the Kaloid stuff with Jimmy and stuff, and guest dosing at whatever clinic here in New Orleans. I mean, I. I might have missed, you know, five days in ten years. I was fucking. So, you know, I was, I was religious that. about getting my dose from the clinic. So. When, when you were on tour with a, a really heavy addiction like that before that, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you get uh, from town to town? Do you have to carry? You mean it, with on the heroin? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to just hunt it down everywhere you go. Well, basically, there towards the end, like with the first lineup on, with uh, with War. Um, we were getting tour support from Roadrunner, and uh, we weren't making much, you know, on the tour of support. But yeah, um, I mean, without incriminating anybody, I, you know, we had someone in a certain town that uh, would get um, a, a lot, you know, um, a couple thousand, you know, about 20, 30, 40 bundles, which is, you know, about four, five, six hundred bags, and basically FedEx it drop it off late at night for early morning delivery, not even hide it, nothing. And would ship it to the clubs. And by, by the end of the tour, you know, there were certain clubs that I knew the owners from our past touring. And the word got around. It was like, you know, hey, don't yet, or not chill out. Fucking don't ever have anything shipped to my fucking club again. You know what I mean? It's just fucking bad, you know. <laughs> well, I always wondered that. You know. I, and, and it's amazing that we never, it's, Absolutely amazing that we never fucking got in any trouble. And then, yeah, there were times where that, you know, wasn't enough to get through, or we'd be waiting for a package from him, and uh, we'd have to go, uh, you know, yeah, I would jump out of the van and sometimes on the board tour, and, uh, you know, 500 bucks in my pocket, jump in the cab, and be like, take me to the worst fucking street in town. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, take me to where the drugs are at. Like, Whatever. And, you know, some cab driver would get the fuck out of my cab, and some of them would know right where to take me. So, and then sometimes I'd get out and walk and ask random people. And, I mean, I got robbed at gunpoint lots of times. I walked, what is it, Cabrini Green in Chicago. And people were always like, you what? I'm like, yeah, I walked right in through the fence. Walked in and had no trouble. The cop didn't get ripped off and everything was fine. You know? And they're like, you're lucky you walked in there and out alive. So, um, yeah, it was, it was it was shady shit. And uh, one time we had a you know we had a wreck in Chicago in the van. And um, of course I asked everybody. I was like, give me whatever you got, paraphernalia, drugs. And I don't know if you remember I used to wear a denim vest all the time back then. I mean, <laughs> those pockets. Do pipes and all, all of these. You know, I didn't real, I didn't even realize. I'm like, well, Jesus Christ! I didn't realize we were carrying this much shit right. between everybody. And um, one member of the band too, for a while, he was carrying. I mean, I was usually like with guns and shit. I mean, I was always like, this is the last fucking thing we need. Was as much as we party and drink is yeah. carrying a pistol, even though you know sometimes you feel like you need protection in some of the areas. I'm like, no. This is going to end up getting used for somebody, just, something yeah, something stupid or turning on yourself or whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it fucking. There was a few shows on the board tour where I ended up, you know, getting back like five minutes later. We wouldn't have played two of the shows. We didn't get to play because I was gone. Off for no, yeah, yeah. So, well. Now the sickness I usually got through. They taught me through, like uh, the skate dig. Shit, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's got a clamp on it. You know, the, the funny thing was, the other band that was on that tour, the Dickies, <laughs> they were like, you know, 
I feel like us now, which no, I'm not, you know, I've just recently switched back to methadone, which is where I think I probably look high right now. But fucking, uh, they, they were like long-term opiate addicts and still using, you know, of course, we hit it off <laughs> right off the bat, but they were like 45, which I'm getting ready to turn 42, but this was way back then, you know. So we help each out each other out in time. I forget what the fuck I was getting to with this, but uh oh. A lot of times when I was sick, you know what I mean, it would, it would take some coke you know, to get me out there. It was like Rocky from War would always say, he's like, I like those nights better because I would drink more heavily just trying to fucking, you know, get yeah, get through the fucking sickness or whatever until I could get some more dope. <clears throat> and uh Usually those shows were looser and I'd talk more shit. It was more like the old buzz of it, you know, because when I started doing so much dope, like on the board tour, it was like, you know, more just kind of standing there and going through the motions. Not now. The energy was gone that once was there. I can look at the videos and see, you know, of course everybody's still like, you guys are a great band. I mean, a lot of bands still stand there, but early buzz of it, I mean, I've always been about, and that's what we're trying to do now, is like, you know, even though I'm old and out of shape, it's fucking bring that energy back, you know? Well, you know, the, one of the, when I saw that show, you know, back in college, man, probably in 93, like, I, I don't know, yeah, mid-90s probably. So you saw, then that, that's the original, well, not original, yeah. Well, the thing that stuck out, believe it or not, more than anything was, uh, I think his name was Randall. Crutchin? No, he was like the cheerleader, the mascot. Oh, Pat, Pat Grimple. He was the singer of his band, Grimple, <clears throat> from the West Coast. And we slowly, he came on as a roadie, and we slowly started integrating him into singing, like backup vocals. And uh, it seemed like his job at the show I was at was to pick fights. Yeah, you know? well, it was almost like an instigation, you know what I mean? It was like, we got to a point where it wasn't really like we were trying to pick fights necessarily, but it was stirring stir shit up. Fucking with people, stirring shit up, you know what I mean? And if you got a reaction, then yeah, you know, depending on how far the reaction went, you know, then sometimes it would turn into a fight. But most of the time, it was like, like in the 930 Club, the old one that had a pipe right in the middle, like I remember him vividly at the end of the board tour, taping himself with duct tape to this fucking pole. So then somebody starts pulling this fucking leg, reaching off the stage, and I keep stepping on there, you know, like, quit fucking with it, quit fucking with it. And the dude fucking pulls his leg and pulls his shoe off. So, of course, you know, I mean, we were always like, you know, this is our cage, don't come into it, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, somebody came up and stage down real quickly, no big deal, but come up there acting like a jackass and running, no man likes that. But we were even more so, like, I was like, if you come up here, anything fucking goes, you know what I mean? If you get whacked in the fucking head or whatever, you you, you chose to walk yeah, into this. Yeah, it's like, I, I would always say, it's like, if you're at a zoo, you don't jump over into the lion's den and fucking go, you know, dance around and not expect to get bit. So, um, you know, we threw our guitars off and dove in and started beating the shit out of this guy. Pre-warned. We've even had, you know, like I say, with, with it now, it's like we're trying to steer away. I mean, it's like trying to just have the energy and fucking without um, having to go to fucking, you know, fights and this and that. But like, uh, we're playing Chattanooga and it was like, I mean, this music itself is fucking, you know, brings out fucking ah, the anger and everybody and shit. Dude, like three fights broke out in a few songs and like, you know, it, it was the first time doing that in so many years. I was like, you know, I, I didn't do the old, you know, like Fugazi or something like, please do it. I was like, well, if y'all are gonna fight, come up here where we can fucking see at least the shit. People kind of laughed and stuff. And this one dude, you know, there was really, it was a really small stage, small club. And he had a hold of my mic stand and he was shaking it back and forth. But he was really into it. I mean, he meant no harm, but I kept going, chill, bro, chill. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fucking out. Shit, I grabbed him back and shit out. I turned around and sing, he's like, boom, like that. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck. Mm. Which normally, you know, I'd have fucking cracked him over the head or whatever. I'd just fucking hit him in the chest. The mic stand? 
Yeah, but it was one of the, you know, something like that. that. Yeah, yeah. Didn't have the metal base, yeah. luckily. That's what I'm saying. Right. But it had the metal base, it could have got ugly. But, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 Pat, you know, I really miss Michael Davidson, who also wrote it for us and did the samples. We have a sound man now, a tour manager, which has made a world of fucking difference, you know what I mean, in how he sounds. He does your, uh, he, did, he, he runs the samples now himself, you know, which uh, <clears throat> he actually, I mean, Mike, you know, was a great roadie and he did a great job with samples, but we did everything so lo-fi because, of course, Roadrunner a lot of times or not just, you know, we never managed the money properly and ended up going to drugs or this or that or whatever. I mean, even on the Gore Tour, we probably had enough money we could have uh, been on a tour bus to manage the money towards that, but instead we had to rent a van and, and put our equipment on Moore's, you know, trailer to pull. Not their tour bus, but they pulled an extra, they had an extra rider truck, so it just worked out that way, which was fun, you know what I mean? But you know, now that we're getting older and shit, I'm like, you know, the tour bus sounds cool, <laughs> fucking more comfortable. What, um, speaking of the samples, what's the, uh, at the beginning of uh, Soar, like the, uh, the song itself, mm -hmm. that uh, two, three minute sound of screaming and all that, what's that from? Man, there's a whole collage of shit really? in there. Uh, I know part of it's got Candyman. Uh, I don't know if you know the horror movie Candyman. Of course, Man, it's really so. great. Yeah, you have to bring it where I went into, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I saw something. I, saw, I could have sworn that I saw a movie, and I picked it up. That I, I was like, that's the fucking sample from that buzz on song. From you know, the like, beginning? Yeah, I thought that I, I don't have, I, I, I thought it was like Wizard of Gore, or you know, <laughs> some kind of like weird first Gordon Lewis movie or something, but it ran in my mind that I saw that somewhere, and so I thought I had it. Well, you know, Brian Brian Hill helped me with a lot of that stuff, and Michael did a lot of that stuff too. So to be honest, it's kind of hard to remember. I do know that um, in the beginning of, of the whole sort of thing, there we mixed a lot of collage and stuff because Roadrunner was really fucking scared, you know, and made us sign this whole thing. Like any legal recourse came back <clears throat> with using the samples that it was on our ass. Because realistically, legally, we should have sought out every fucking single thing, and that would have taken so much money. Yeah. And uh, so we changed everything a lot. We run it through, uh, we record it, run it through the keyboard, change the pitch, whatever. Yeah, anything to be like, well, we did this and did that. So it's really not the actual original recording in case that ever happened. But I was always like, unless this thing turns into fucking the next chord record, you know, I don't think we have anything to worry about, which is how it turned out. But uh, we also, over that whole beginning, sure, me and Brian were both whispering, you have to listen very close, you know, kill yourself. Right. Kept saying, kill yourself. <laughs> and Billy, <clears throat> Billy Anderson was our producer, and he, um, he was the sound man for the Melvins back then, and this is back when uh, Melvins were touring with Nirvana. And he had actually played our CD before it came out for uh, for Cobain, which not that it had anything to do with it or whatever. But that's yeah, right. Right. <laughs> it was just ironic, fucking, you know, we're mumbling that under it, and we would do a lot of that type of shit too, where it's like if you mixed everything together in a big collage, if anybody did hear it you know, from the movie, you know, how the fuck did they sue? It's all mixed in together. But I know, I know a lot of. Uh, a lot of the more soundscape stuff back then, Brian would get, and I would find a lot more of the actual term stuff. And some of that shit, to be honest, was just like whatever popped up. You know, we'd watch movies that we liked, and then just fucking if we heard something, boom, we'd have it set up. We had the tape deck set up to fucking record and get it. You know? I want to ask you about, uh, you know, Charlotte. We have uh, <laughs> my job. We have a. Uh, sister company up there, we go up there all the time, and uh, one, it seems kind of like an unlikely place to birth a band like this, but uh, 
You know, I, I shot a, I did two war videos, so I kind of know those guys pretty good. Uh -huh. We were looking up the incident <laughs> of uh, Rocky getting arrested. It turns out you got taken to jail that night too. Yeah. Can you tell us the story? Uh, yeah, I was actually there. I had a band before Buzzle called Sewer Puppy, and uh, which actually the demo is out on vinyl now, and we sell them out on the road now. But uh, I was handing out flyers <clears throat> for a Sewer Puppet show, and we had a uh, time before that Gore played in Charlotte. <clears throat> it was the same club owner and the same club name, it was in a different building. And uh, we opened for him that time, so I knew what they looked like out of costume, and it kind of met him. I didn't really get to know him or anything, but I knew what they looked like out of costume. Well, <clears throat> I'm standing at the door, handing out flyers, and all of a sudden, I see Rocky the singer coming out in handcuffs, and, you know, little, you know, little lit up, drunk, you know, I'm like, what the fuck, what the fuck's going on, you know, and the cops are like, you know, back off, them, you know, they, they were trying to make sure they could out without fucking there being any reaction. You know, they want to sneak him out and take him off and arrest him. And, uh, <laughs> so I started yelling, you know what I mean? Gore's getting arrested, Gore's getting arrested. And they're immediately like, you know, shut the fuck up. You're going to jail too. Like, fuck you, what am I doing? I'm not breaking the law. So, you know, I kept yelling and screaming. And then I bought another buddy of mine, Hans Dress. Uh, he ended up, you know, coming along, hanging along. Worse. They slapped cuffs on him, and uh, I'm pretty sure I grabbed the arm of the cop or did, did something to where I laid a hand on him, and that's when they flipped me over, <clears throat> like pinned me down, four or five cops, and I guess why they hit me down, like tons of riot cops came in, because I remember pulling me off the ground, and I'm looking at this whole crowd of people, and they're like, oh, look at that it was a sunny or riot charge, though. Yep, that's what they, they tried. I mean, and it was funny when they were when they were processing me in. The um, like even the magistrate was like, I haven't seen this charge since like the '70s. You know what I mean, it was like one of those charges. If they really didn't have anything else to hit you with in a situation like that, that was just something they called you. Yeah. And the ironic thing is, I fucking got probably the worst. Um, sentence of anybody, like Mike Plumney, the guy that owns the fucking bar, he, I think he fucking lost his liquor license for six months or something, Rocky, Rocky, I think, was agreed not to play in the state for a whole year, paid some kind of fine, well, I had to pay like fucking, I don't know, I think a thousand hours of community service, something fucking crazy that last too fucking long. But, uh, I mean, the funny thing was, even that, I mean, as much as it was like something that was just fucking, where I, I, mean, I didn't know why they arrested him, you know what I mean? You think this band tours everywhere, it's like, why the fuck are they getting arrested here? And, uh, <clears throat> uh, shit, I'm gonna check what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah. I've just always been like fucking. Back, back then, I was very retaliatory against cops. You know what I mean? Sure. It's like I had no problem with if I thought they arrested somebody unjustly, I'd fucking jump on their back, fucking you know, just do some pretty stupid shit. And I, you know, anymore, I'm fucking uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I've learned it doesn't get you fucking anywhere. But um. Uh, I guess that's basically it. There was something yeah. I was fucking getting at. With well, one last that. question, like, uh, you know, what are, now that you guys are touring and back on the road, what's next? You know, what do you, you got plans? Plan? Well, um, we're kind of back doing a balancing act. Um, Dixie's still got weed here going pretty heavily. And uh, they just finished recording a new album. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, as soon as we get done with this tour, we're only doing two weeks. Right now, I think on the fourth of the day. <clears throat> when we finish um, our two weeks, which is all southeast, he's got two days off and he starts a five week weed eater tour. And then he'll be done in, uh, 
he'll be done at the end of next month and have like a week before Buzzlin goes to Europe. So the ironic thing is Buzzlin has never been to Europe. Because Roadrunner pulled us out of one tour and I was supposed to do a neurosis <clears throat> for really no legitimate reason. The owner was like, we want you to keep touring the States. And uh, the second one, I think, is when I went, to, went into like a rehab or something the first time. And uh, the third one we just didn't show up in the airport. Things were all fucked up. So <clears throat> this time things were set in place. We're playing the Roadbird Festival. I know we play like on Thursday night. Uh, I don't know the date, but then I knew we got we playing Hellfest later on. But the road burn we were doing two weeks in Europe around that, playing Belgium, Italy, France. Well, maybe not France. France is for the Hellfest. So. Other than the Southeast thing, we've got those two European things planned out. And then, uh, after that. Hopefully by that time we'll have some more interest in labels. We'll do a new record. But I'm not sure if we're gonna have to do a demo or whatever. We've got like maybe two or three new songs worked up. We're not playing them live because we figure everybody would hear uh, the older shit that they have. So but uh, yeah, we're definitely gonna do a new record. We'll keep touring, but uh <clears throat> Weed Eater's already got, you know, such an intense tour schedule that uh, we, we pretty much came into it with like, you know, he, Dixie's worked his ass off since Buzz uh, disbanded, you know, he kept going with Weed Eater and I got a lot of respect for that, you know, to keep it going for that long and that consistent and uh, I'm not trying to step on the toes of what they're doing and what they need to do. Like I said, we have the same management, so we're kind of playing a balancing act to keep uh, everything happy with their label and what they're going to do to her and not have Dixie burn out either. You know? yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in this position right now. I mean, he's not even supposed to be done with all of us till May 1st. You know what I mean? He's on tour right now, steady, till May 1st. <clears throat> Other than, you know, two days off here, five days off here, which, you know, those barely count. Because when you get a day off on something like this, it's really just sleep. You know, so it's just constantly going, going. But, you know, it originally started out as like a reunion, do a few shows. And then I was like, you know, when we started rehearsing and stuff, I was like, you know, you guys are just fucking, you know, really doing this and just not doing these shows. To, make a few bucks and uh, everybody was like fuck yeah so um it's been going really well you know what i mean we've been getting really good responses a lot of people from that have seen us from the earlier days think it sounds better some people are like it's you know too much more controlled now i guess because there's no fucking broken glass flying everywhere yeah, it's just getting broken and yeah, i'm not busting my head open anymore and, you know, no, I'm not fucking 100% completely sober, but I'm fucking not fucking nearly, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, sorry, you know, I think I uh, <coughs> pushed it to the limit back then. If I uh, go do round two of that, I'm not going to live through it. So I'm not out here to try to do that, you know what I mean? It's like, I want to play music and fucking, you know, to me, it's like, like when we first started, we didn't really, all that shit wasn't there. It was fucking put on an energetic kick-ass show. That's what we're trying to do again. It's just a hell of a lot harder being 41 and not in very good shape. So. <laughs> anyway, that's a good way to end it. Cool. Cool.